So let's think if you, you, you have a solution for the problem, the solution involves uh, selecting five places. If those five places, uh, in those five places you have 10% of the distribution of that species J or more, then those five places will be selected. And you multiply, and, and you sum the cost, you sum up the cost of all those five places. And the summation of those five places will be the value of your objective function Z. Okay? The thing is, you have many solutions for the same problem. This is why you want to minimize the value of Z. So, you have a solution that includes selecting five sites, but you can have another solution that includes ten sites, another solution that includes only four sites. And then what you're going to do is to solve the problem, given that the target has been achieved for these pieces. And then you will compare solutions, the cost, the total cost of the solution, and you will stick with the solution that has the lowest cost. Right? So this is what the problem is called, the minimum set coverage. What is the minimum set I need to do, I, I need to have to protect the species? If I want to represent a given proportion of biodiversity that has been uh, set up in my target at the minimum possible cost. You guys get it? Yeah? So the other problem, and perhaps the most common one, is called the maximal representation problem. This is a very different problem. You're not trying to find what set of areas will have the, li the, the lowest cost. You have a fixed budget to invest in conservation. You, you have a fixed budget to allocate in conservation actions. Then the problem becomes, how can I represent the maximum of biodiversity as possible under a predefined budget? Okay? So, <clears throat> you have again your objective function. It is that translates the objective you had, that is represent the maximum biodiversity as possible with uh, under a predefined target. You have, of course, to achieve the target you predetermined for that species, okay? And the total cost of the areas you are selecting should not be higher than the budget you have, okay? So, <clears throat> you have this uh, YJ. It is one if the species occur in at least one cell and it is zero if the species is not represented. It means that you are summing the number of species for which the target has been, has been achieved. Okay? That's the response you get from this objective function. It is the number of species achieving the target you get for your budget. So it means that if, this, if the, the set of sites you were picking up to build uh, this conservation network, area network, if these sites achieve the representation level for the species you have predefined, then you will uh, choose those sites, but the total cost of those sites together should not exceed the budget you have. And all the solutions to that problem will come here, which is, uh, the number of species achieving the target you have, right? And you are trying, obviously, to maximize that function and not minimize. You want to maximize the number of species you can protect with the same amount of resource, okay? That is clear? Any doubts? So, <clears throat> for doing that, we have some stages in the planning process that you should follow. So the first one would be to identify and involve the stakeholders. Every people that has an engagement or is involved with the problem should be, uh, at least in theory, consulted. You need to talk with the people because conservation is basically a social problem. 
You don't, you don't do conservation with working with biodiversity alone. You have to get people engaged in the problem, okay? Then you have to identify your conservation goals. What do you want to protect? Is that species? Are you trying to protect habitat types? Are you trying to protect ecological processes like uh, seed dispersion, dispersal? I don't know. Then you have to compile the data that what you have been doing this week with uh, Tao. You have to formulate your conservation targets. Means that you really need to decide what will be the target for each feature you are trying to protect, okay? And this could be hard. This is usually done uh, with some workshops from people discussing what will be the best targets for, for each feature you're trying to protect. Then you have to review the existing target achievement. This is basically a gap analysis. You need to know how much of the target you're setting is already, has been already achieved with current protected areas, okay? There, there will always be some protected areas already established and maybe part of the target you are setting is, has been already accomplished by those areas. So you need to know uh, how much uh, of, of the target you need to achieve is lacking so you can fill that gap with your planning. Then you do the prioritization per se. It is selecting new conservation actions. And again, I'm stressing that conservation action is it's not only setting uh, areas aside, okay? Establishing new protected areas is a kind of conservation action, very important one. But these conservation actions could be related to management or habitat restoration, invasive species control, okay? Then you will implement new conservation actions, and this is perhaps the, the most difficult part because it involves political will and uh, a higher level of engagement. And then you should, in theory, maintain and keep these areas under monitoring. So you need to know if the targets are being achieved, if your plan is working, so you can have an update of this plan um, from time to time, right? Some of these you, we will see in this course, or you have been seeing this with Tiago, Tao, and Adolfo. So I will focus on, on this part of selecting new conservation areas. This is what we're going to do uh, after lunch using a particular software for that, okay? Then, once conservation is um, a, a social uh, science. You need to have all those uh, ecological uh, aspects of, of biodiversity and, and, and stuff, but you also need to engage people. The conservation outputs you have can be perceived differently depending on the perspective of stakeholders. So doing a systematic conservation plan could obviously have benefits like it has economic benefits because it will be cost effective. So if it is cost effective, you are trying to have benefits from uh, economic benefits. It is transparency to, the, to decision making. It means that once you have a very clear problem that is well defined as a mathematical problem, it, is, it has transparency. Anyone can understand what you're doing. You can replicate that and this is not the problem. You have some scientific basis in decision making. So you're not choosing sites for any other reason. You have a scientific knowledge behind that. You have an explicit formulation of the objectives because you were dealing with a mathematical problem formally defined. And you have focuses on data collection. Okay, so people will try to get data to do the planning. And this is good because you you, you, will, you will do necessarily a conservation assessment to get this data and you 
know more about the biodiversity of the place uh, you're trying to protect. It can have some disadvantages. Uh, so you can have some loss of economic opportunity. When you're protecting an area, it will be some kind of conflict. Maybe that area can have some opportunity costs. I mean, the people would make money on that area, and now you're trying to protect it, and they will not uh, get in this. It sometimes could be a complex methodology, although it is clear, sometimes it's very difficult to explain to, to other people what you're doing. And it's not difficult to explain what is systematic conservation planning or what is a plan that you apply in a systematic approach. Sometimes when people really want details, it could be difficult to explain, for example, the algorithm you use to select places or just to ex explain those equations and what you were doing, okay? It could be. You could have some legislative issues that will uh, end up with results that may be hard to validate. So you're planning for something, we're saying that a place is important for conservation, then, then you cannot establish a protected area there, but by any other reason, sometimes political reasons. And you can have communication problems because sometimes it could be hard to explain that. <clears throat> and you could have some threats or uncertainties about what you're doing. So, you can have some privacy constraints. Maybe there is a place that is very important for conservation, but is a private lane. You can have some misinterpretation of results. So other people will read the plan, and they may not understand exactly what you are saying. And this could be a problem. And perhaps you have the biggest problem of all, that is known willingness to adopt the plan. And this usually happens because you have not identified what were the stakeholders involved. So you did not engage people, and then you end up with people that are not willing to do what you are saying, what that is the best for that moment, okay? Then, <clears throat> more recently, uh, we have developed methods to cope with uncertainty in data and models. Methods for understanding the consequences of climate change and how can we integrate that into conservation planning. I'll get to, there, uh, to this uh, later. And we have developed a lot of user-friendly softwares. So we have the, the worldwide used software called MarkSan. It's a software to do uh, conservation prioritization. It's uh, easy to use, it has a friendly graphic user interface, it runs on Windows. And we have other softwares like Consnet uh, and Zonation. It's the one we're using today. And there is a tendency in the literature that conservation planning needs to be more rooted in broader socio-economic framework to get the plan uh, actually implemented. So, most of these things are just academic exercises. We're discussing methods, we're developing new methods to solve even more complex problems. And not necessarily the results of those papers are being implemented. They're not necessarily going to on the ground conservation actions and resulting in plans that, are, that will be implemented in the long term. Okay, so we need to uh, develop those methods, but we also need to look at the practical thing and try to implement the plans we're using. I'll give you some examples of this today. <clears throat> so in 2009, uh, these scientists, my friend Nate Moilani, Kerry Wilson, and Hugh Possingham, they published this book called Spatial Conservation Prioritization. So spatial conservation prioritization uses quantitative techniques to generate information about conservation priorities. And, it's, and it relates to conservation planning, but also we, with other types of assessments dealing with multiple goals and actions. So it also relates with land use planning for other reasons than uh, conservation planning, and natural resource management too, okay? So 
this spatial conservation prioritization is kind of a broad approach to define priorities within assessments that have m multiple, multiple goals, okay? And this is a science. So systematic conservation plan, is a, it's a science. It has 30 years since the 80s we're trying to discuss this. And it's, and it's growing, growing fast. So here you can see the number of papers published from 1995 to 2008. Get this from that book of Ate Moilani and colleagues. And it's rising fast as well as the number of citations. And you have the number of papers published why uh, the most of the papers published within this field came from US and Australia, but South Africa is here. We have a very good group here working with conservation planning, led by Richard Cowling. And then you have some journals that are used to publish things like that. If you want to see conservation planning uh, papers, you should definitely read Biological Conservation and Conservation Biology, but also Biodiversity and Conservation, Ecological Applications, Diversity and Distributions, Animal Conservation, and a journal like that now publishes papers about conservation planning, okay? 